number five, where the Ramab says, Vachatsidim Rishonim, the earlier Chasidim, who you matin, Deoshalan, Miderchem, Tsos, Kenegish, Deer, Tsavos. Meaning they were slightly, they went off the center point, knowingly. There's a certain predilection where you go off from the, the extreme on one side. Right? You have to the right two extremes. Either they get closer to the right or they go off center to the left. And what is that? That's Zelif Nimushus Hadin. That's going beyond the call of duty. Beyond. This din means, din is precision, what's right. And although you know what's right, I want to do a little better than what's right. I'll give you an example. The Talmud tells us that there was a great rabbi. His name was Rab Rabbi Pareto. Rabbi Pareto. And he had a student. And the student, there used to be an expression, he was as thick as molasses. And whatever you taught him, it just didn't take. And Rav Prader said, he will teach the student. And he taught him something 200 times. Yeah? And after teaching him, having the patience, and we're talking about he was an ordinary rabbi. This rabbi was one of the te leading Torah sages of the generation. And he took on this responsibility 200 times he taught this person. And after 200 times, it clicked. Doesn't say how much he taught him, but he taught him a significant amount of knowledge. And after he finished teaching him 200 times and he had it, all of a sudden, a bird flies by. And this person, who he taught, gets distracted. He's, look at the bird. The moment he said, look at the bird, all that he taught him was erased. He forgot everything he taught him. That was the consequence of that distraction. So what do you think Rav Prada did? He taught him another 200 times. Until finally, it stuck. He taught him 400 times. 400 times, could you imagine? After four, the first 200 times, you know, you're at your wit's end. Finally, you succeed. And the last moment, it's out the window. As if he never taught him anything. Another 200 times. A heavenly voice comes to Rabbi Prady. He says, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a choice. Either you could live 400 years for your dedication and unceasing concern for this person. You taught him 400 times. I will add 400, you will live 400 years, which is unheard of. He lived in an era, Peel did not live more than 100 years, 120 years, 400 years, unheard of. But in the merit of your sacrifice, dedication to teach this person 400 times, which is beyond the pale, I will add 400 years to your life. Or in your merit, I will forgive all the sins of the generation. In your merit, the Jewish people, all the sins will be forgiven. You have a choice. So he says, I prefer you forgive all the sins of the generation. I'll live a normal life extension. Expand no more than four, more normal, normal life. So Hashem says, the, Basco, the heavenly voice says, because you were so selfless that you passed on the 400 years, not only will I forgive the generation your merit, you will live 400 years. I will pray to live 400 years which was something out of the ordinary. What he did, did he have an obligation to do such a thing? He had no obligation. You try and try, invest, sacrifice. You reach your wit's, wit's end, that's it. But because Rav Prater was a chosid, he went beyond his obligation. He felt for whatever reason, he wants to go beyond the pale and make a difference in this person's life. Even at the end, you're given a choice. 400 years, do you know how many mitzvahs you do? You live another 400 years. He already was special. You can add to your account, or you know something? You can be selfless and have the whole generation's negative account wiped out. You know something? 
I live for God's glory. I think it'll be a greater sanctification of God's name if the Jewish people are forgiven. I give it all up for them. Hashem says, again, because he's so special, not only will I do that, I add 400 years to your life. But every aspect of his decision process was he went beyond the equidistant point. To the right. I have no obligation. I'm doing more right. Now you make me an offer. I'll do more right. Forgive the generation. I don't need the 400 years. Although I'll be a beneficiary. Because I'll do so many more mitzvahs. God says, because of that, I attack on another 400 years on your life. Or you will live the full 400 years. That's a chosid. You know, it's interesting. The Talmud tells us there was a certain great rabbi, a member of the Talmudic era. He had a son who passed away and he died. And then afterwards, he came back. Somehow, he came back. So his father says to him, what did you see over there in the world to come? He says, I saw El Yonim Lamato of Tachton Lamalo. Literally means, he says, I saw people in this world who are on top of the totem pole. In the world to come, they're on the bottom of the totem pole. And the ones in this world who are barely noticed, they're the ones that are on top of the totem pole. That's what he says. I saw an upside down world. In this world, these are the heroes, the winners. And the other people are seen as losers. In the world to come, these losers are the winners. What's it all about? How, why are you a loser in this world and you're a winner in the world to come? The answer is because these people are truly not losers. Because they're willing to forego acknowledgement and honor and glory. And they do it purely for the sake of something which most people don't do. They look like a bunch of fools. He's a fool. You got to look look out for yourself. That's the perspective. You know, charity begins at home. That's where it begins. In God's book, not necessarily. Maybe you have to worry about the other person before you worry about yourself. As long as you have sufficient for yourself. So therefore, I saw an upside down world there. What's here is on top. There it's on the bottom. Or what's on the bottom is on top. That's the chosid. If the chosid would be seen as a hero, you real everybody would gravitate to be a chosid. But no, nobody's running to be that exceptional person, willing to give his right arm, his left arm for his fellow Jew. Nobody's there. But the chosid is the one, it's not only does he do everything exactly balanced, even though it's not balanced, and he understands it's not balanced, he goes beyond, beyond the call of duty. The Talmud tells a story there was a person, he was responsible, he was a administrator of a communal charity. And it was difficult years for the Jewish people. And there was a lack of food. And he had distributed all the communal funds. And there was nothing left. The coffer was empty. And this woman comes to him and says, my family is starving. I'm a widow. I have seven sons, seven children. And you have to give me some money, otherwise we're all going to die of starvation. And there was literally nothing left in the, in, the, in the communal charity chest. So he says, I'm sorry, I distributed all the funds, there's nothing left. So she says, but you realize, if you don't do for me, what's at stake is a woman and her seven children, we're all going to die of starvation. This person's name was Binyamin Hatzadik. He was known as Binyamin the Tzadik. Not just Binyamin. Evidently, the reason why he had that appellation, Tzadik, is he must have been a Tzadik. Otherwise, nobody's calling Binyamin a Tzadik. So he went and he dug into his own pocket. When I say dug, he dug deep into his own pocket. And he took the little bit he had and he gave it to this woman. And in that merit, not the merit, because what he did, she they survived. The woman and seven children, they lived. They didn't die of starvation. Fast forward, Binyamin at Tzadik, is on his deathbed. He's about to die. The advocate angels come to Hashem and said, you know something? I think this man deserves an extension on life. Why does he accept? Why? Because there was an incident in the past. This woman had come and he could have legitimately sent her off without anything. But when he heard that what's at stake is her and her children's lives, 
He provided and they lived. So in the merit, merit, merit of this man, these people were able to continue living. Hashem says, if that's the case, I will add 22 years to his life. And it, the Gemara says, the Talmud says, but Yom Ratzadik lived another 22 years, which he, those 22 years weren't his years. They were added to his life. What is that? What did Binyam Natsarik do? He did an act of that was chesed, that was chosid. He went beyond the call of duty. Whenever you go beyond the call of duty, and there's no reason other than because you want to do better, because you know that's what God wants you to do, then God's there for you. He's there for you. But most people don't see it the way you see it. Maybe you see it as a People take advantage. You know, there's an expression, you, you're a sucker. He's not a sucker. He understands what, he's no fool. It's calculated understanding, whatever it is. Person lends a person money. He knows there's a risk, but the person truly needs the money. And he doesn't want to embarrass him. So people say, you're a fool. Don't you realize you lend this man money, you're not getting your money back. But the lender knows that the man that's going to make a difference He'll maintain his dignity to his family. He'll be able to put food on the table. Other people don't understand, but the person who's willing to help him understands that. And despite the fact that he's going to take a loss, he'll do it anyway. That's Chosit. You understand everything. You have it clearly. It's not because you're stingy or miserly. It has nothing to do with this. It's because you truly appreciate the issue and you're willing to go beyond the pale to help that person. That's Chosit. And that's the way the Hasidim were shown. The earlier Hasidim, that's the way they, that was the lens that was used. You know, you go to the optometrist, they fit you for glasses. They put on these, these large metal part of the machinery and they keep putting the lenses in. You see better, you see worse. Which number, what line could you see? And based on the lens they put in, that's that's how clear you see. Till yet you see perfectly. Despite the fact without that, you're as blind as a bat, as they used to say. Blind as a bat. But if you have the right lens, you can read the tiny print, which most people can't even read. But that's the chassid. The chassid, he sees through a lens, which most people don't see through that lens. You know, in life, you have to have role models. You have to have, to have and especially you have to be, if you have that special role model, you're very fortunate. Because everything in life is by example. And if you're touched by that role model, you want to emulate that person because you see that person is special. If you were exposed to people who truly lived their lives this way, it wasn't their own glory. They only saw the issue, the need. And that's what they zoomed in on. You know, they used to have a thing called a zoom lens. Today, I don't think they use the word zoom lens, right? They would actually, they noticed everything. They didn't miss a beat. And you value it. You emulate it. I always say, you know, today, Baruch Hashem, many things are printed in English. And one time, the only thing that was available was in Hebrew. Well, Yiddish, the person wasn't sufficiently learned to understand it. He was, he was in the dark. Today, we have biographies about very special people. Really, tzaddikim. Great people. Nobody's telling you, you can't be a Ramosha Feinstein. Zech He had a photographic memory. He had a genius mind. Unbelievable. What he was, you read it, it's not to be believed. What he was, even as a, as a young child. Could you be an Einstein? You're not an Einstein. You can't be an Einstein. But Ramosha Feinstein says it. What he came up with, what he understood, you read that, or Rav Steinman, Regardless of what he was as a Torah sage, but it's the way his sensitivity towards people's feelings. He saw what 99% of people didn't see, what was behind the issue, and he addressed the issue. Which most, most people, even the person himself, didn't understand what he needed, but he understood what that person needed. And you read this, and if you're a person who has the capacity for that growth, you're touched by it. And you touch by it, you assume that 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 behavior pattern. You want to, because you see that as being special. There's a famous story 
Rav Chaim Brisk, Rav Chaim Salvechik, was the chief rabbi of Brisk, which was a city in Belarus. And as great as he was in Torah, supposedly they say that in Chesed, his Torah paled compared to his Chesed. So, um, and it reached a point, you know, he had nothing. He would give every, everything away to help people. Chief rabbi, a man comes to him and asks him a halachic question. For the four cups during the Seder, could you use milk? Do you have to use wine? Maybe you could use milk. And his wife is there listening to the person presenting the question. You know, Pesach, everybody's coming. People are buying, purchasing, all kinds of questions. So he takes out a wad of bills and gives the man a wad of bills. So his wife says to him, I don't understand. The man came to ask a question. Could you use milk for the for the dalkosis for the four cups at the Seder? What are you giving a wad of bills? Why? Because you don't understand. If the man is asking you, could you use milk, that means the man has nothing in his house for Pesach. Has nothing. No matzah, no meat, no veg, nothing. That's why he wants to know, could he use milk? If that's the case, I will provide him with all the, 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 the means that he should be able to purchase it. Another person said, you know, yes, no. Okay, finish. That's the end of the story. Rechaim Briskin went right into it. He zoomed in on it. What's the issue? Why is he asking that question? It's obvious the man has nothing. If that's the case, I, I have an obligation, or I, he, because he was, so, was that kind of person, to provide and to help that man out. That he shouldn't be able to provide for his family, for pace to have a Seder. No humility is such a valuable characteristic. A person's humble. Moshe Rabbeinu was the most humble human being who ever walked the face of the earth. But yet, when he came down with the first set of tablets and he saw the Jews involved in idolatry, what did he do? He didn't consult with God. He went and smashed the tablets. I mean, a man is so humble. How do you take on that level of responsibility to break the tablets? Humble has nothing to do with not knowing who you are. Moshe Rabbeinu knew who he was. He knew there's no human being with the knowledge and the clarity that he had. He knew this. He's head and shoulders above, above everyone. He's the equivalent of the whole Jewish people combined. But you know what humility is? Despite that, therefore what? So I know more than that. Therefore what? I still got to do what I got to do. I'm not gaining mileage. I'm not interested in mileage. I do what I do because that's what I'm supposed to do. Does anybody pride himself that he breathes so many, so many breaths per minute? And your heart beats so many beats per minute. Or you eat three square meals a day. Do you pride yourself? That's your function. So what if you if you were created to do the will of God and bring glory to his name, you don't pride yourself. I always tell over a story. Comes the bonus time. So this one comes in, he gets so much, such a bonus. Another, this other person gets no bonus. And um, so he goes to the person who made the decision. Whether he gets, he says, I think I deserve a bonus. He says, why? He says, you know, there wasn't a day I came late to work. And I stayed all the hours. And I didn't embezzle any time. And I didn't embezzle any money. I was honest. I didn't steal I could have stolen endless times over. Don't you think I deserve a bonus for that? Yeah, that's the society. I could have stolen. You would have had 20% less on your profits, and I did it. And if we have 20% more. So the person says, what you did, that's what you're supposed to do. You're not supposed to be a thief. You're supposed to be responsible. A bonus you get only get if you bring an extra profit to the company. That You didn't do that. So you don't meet the criteria to be deserving of a bonus. If a person was created, are you created for God's glory? Do you pride yourself? Well, most people are not interested in God's glory. So you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're living your life the way you're supposed to live your life. You could say, I'm fortunate that I saw it correctly. I'm fortunate. 
but you don't pride yourself. That's humility. Being humble. If you're humble, you meet a person, he's head and shoulder, he towers above you in every sense of the word. Could you for a moment behave in an arrogant way in the presence of that person? Here, this man is, is, is a giant in every sense of the word. And you want, for the few pennies you put in the charity box, you want to pride yourself you're a philanthropist because other people pass on the charity box. So humility means you see it right. God owes me nothing. I do what I'm supposed to be doing. You know, the lawyers, you know, a, a, a Jew, even are not, are not permitted to, to kill. What about for self-defense? Self-defense, you have an obligation to protect your life. The Talmud says, Habor l'horkos, God, if somebody rises to take your life, Hashkem v'horgo, you have to preempt him and you have to kill him. Because that's your obligation to save your life. So somebody witnesses two people in entanglement, and this one person initiated it. I wanted to victimize, and the other person stands and saves his life. So the other person says, you know, you're a terrific guy. You saved your life. You preempted him. You know, I don't know if I could have done what you did. Because, you know, I when I see blood, I faint. <laughs> person says, I'm not priding myself. If you value your life, you do what you what I did. If you miss the boat, then you, you worry about fainting for blood and you won't be alive any longer. That's it. If life is doing what you're supposed to be doing, you stay humble. Who am I? I'm who I'm supposed to be. Hillel had it straight. Hillel, the Talmud tells us that if the Torah wouldn't have been given to Moshe Rabbeinu, Hillel was humble enough that he was qualified to receive the Torah. So why didn't he? Because the generation wasn't worthy. But he had a level of humility, Hillel. What was Hillel? Hillel says in Pirkei Ovos, it may not lead me. If I don't do for me, who's doing for me? And if I don't, and even what I do for myself, what, what have I accomplished? I'm still so far behind the eight ball. So if that's the case, I better get, get to it immediately. If not now, whenever. I've delayed long enough. Because if you delay too long, it's going to be too late. So what did Hillel look at? Hillel looked at what he didn't yet accomplish. He was he didn't have time to look about what he did accomplish and pride himself. He always looked at what I did not accomplish because there's so much to accomplish, I can't get distracted and delude myself with all this nonsense. But you have to have humility for that. The one person is lacking, he's always looking for the pat on the back. Person speaks. He's a phenomenal lecture. He's waiting for, for the applause. Then he wants to get a rating. You know, by the sound of the applause, they know what kind of rating he gets. And then afterwards, you know, they project his name. His, his name's been published in every paper. And he finds out in the Amsterdam news they didn't put his name he gets he gets a little gets down a little bit is that why if the objective of that lecture wasn't to stroke your ego it was to inform people of information which was necessary to make society a better society so what if you the, the applause wasn't that loud so what if you want to put it to every paper what difference does it make that's not what it was all about. But that's the value of humility. You see through a lens which is a clear lens. Otherwise, the lens is all smudged. It's smudged with your nonsense, with your foolishness, with your ego. You know, a person that eats, you know, it's interesting, there's a halacha, that if you eat cheese, if you eat, let's say you drink a glass of milk, and soon after that you want to eat meat, not together, Allah, you're permitted. You just have to eat something or drink something to rinse out your mouth. You can eat meat immediately. What about if you eat cheese? 
regular cheese. They have to wash your hands with soap. Of course, when you touch cheese, you have the fattiness of the cheese on your hands. So if afterwards you can eat meat, the fattiness of the of the residue of the milk. So when you engage with the meat, you're gonna the, the milk, the residue of the cheese will go on the meat. So you have to wash your hands with soap that your hands should be fully cleansed. You have, you know, a per, pe person who touches his lenses on his glasses, they get smudged. It's all smudged. What does it smudge with? With fat. I'm saying with fingerprints. What, you know, there are no two fingerprints which are exactly the same. It's a known fact. That's how unique the fingerprints of a human being is. You can't duplicate a fingerprint. Every ego is very unique to that person. You got your fingerprint on your on your lens. You see yourself through that fingerprint. If you're humble, your fingerprint doesn't make that mark on the lens. You see clear. But if that fingerprint is a fatty fingerprint, because you are inflated, that lens is what a distorted lens. It's a smudged lens. You're going to do that. You got to 